designer and proud member of the ICAA. Welcome to the second in this Classicism at Home video series on the restoration of Ardrossan, an iconic early 20th century Georgian revival masterpiece by Horace Trombauer, which was built in 1912 for the Montgomery family. In the previous installment, we were introduced to the house and its land, to the architect who created it, and to the challenging physical state we found it in 85 years later. Today, we'll examine the myriad challenges and opportunities it presented, and we'll explore the process that involved numerous artisans and craftsmen whose combined talents and work resulted in what we see today. Today, as always, people want homes that allow them to live, laugh, and love in a personal environment that expresses the enduring principles of classical design, and this is especially important in the restoration of significant historic houses. So how do we determine the right approach to restoration? It's always a complex undertaking because there are many different definitions of right and all are legitimate. It can be right for the period or right for the spirit of the period or right for the original owner expressing his own version of the spirit of the period or even right for a 21st century lifestyle while respectful of the original period. Sometimes a client will provide brilliant direction as Robert Montgomery Scott did for our Drossen in saying, make her the beautiful old lady that she is. But it is not always so clear. Sometimes we must search for clues to discover the spirit of the building and uncover its uniqueness. Only then can we create a narrative that describes something memorable something enduring. And here's a case in point. At the same time that we were restoring our Drossen for the original family with every element of furnishings intact, we were also restoring Portledge, another Trumbauer work built just two years before. Here, though, our client was a 30-year-old bachelor starting with a completely blank canvas. The process of defining the goals, evaluating options, and acquiring collections was radically different. With nothing but original drawings to go from, we had to discover a personal history for the house, one that was unique, compelling, and individually expressive, comfortable in its own aesthetics, but in no way a period room from a museum frozen in time. After all, even the most ardent historic house enthusiasts blanch at the idea of living only by candlelight. So back to our Drossen, what was so astonishing about this project was that the house retained not only all of its original architectural features, but also all the original furnishings, art, and collections. Absolutely everything. It's a rare situation for an interior designer to say, even without buying a single piece of furniture, that it was a truly challenging and satisfying project. Now, while the family still owned everything, not every piece was in its intended location. Over the years, some pieces had been moved from one of the many family houses on the property to another. Others were tucked away in endless closets, and still others were discovered in hidden corners in various basements. And so the treasure hunt began. I'll show you what our sleuthing uncovered. Originally, the living room looked like this, with beautiful paneling, cornices, and plaster ceiling intact and then here, as it did when we found it in 1995. Until at last, the way it is today, looking towards the portrait of the Colonel and across the room to Mrs. Montgomery. The library in 1995, looking towards the bookcases and now after restoration. And here, looking towards the fireplace before and after, when we had used a Spanish linen to express the Edwardian character of the room and where the chinoiserie element was reinforced, this exceptional pair of Chippendale mirrors that the Montgomerys bought on a shopping trip in London at Frank Partridge and Sons. Now, having repaired the hobble legs on this beautiful sofa and the wonderful embellished settee frame, the wall fabric was reproduced with an additional chinoiserie motif and woven in a small mill in France. All was going perfectly, until we discovered that the loom eventually used was two inches narrower than anticipated. Compound that around the perimeter of the room and we ended up one width short. Momentary panic set in 
and we went back to studying the elevations and crunching the math to see how we could magically expand the coverage. In the end, it was worth it, because you'll recall that we started here, went through this, and arrived happily here. This is the solarium, a mirror image of one on the opposite side of the house serving as the breakfast room. And the restoration of the stone in this room employed a series of conservation efforts from applying poultices to wet brushing and finally a fine spray of glass beads, which is much softer than sandblasting, to arrive at this stage of mellowed patina. This is the ballroom looking east and south when we started and where we are today, with its exquisite furniture restored, along with Mrs. Montgomery's threatened sofa and the Aubusson rug, which suffered a two-foot diameter hole after encountering too many high heels and beloved dog claws, and it's now perfectly restored. And looking north, you'll recall the sad state of the silk-covered chairs and leather top tables, and as restored with every element cared for, but restored with the lightest possible touch, until this room was returned to the supremely elegant space it was meant to be. We flow past the study, host to many, many post-dinner brandy and cigar moments, down the glorious long hall and staircase illuminated by Caldwell lanterns, companions to the exquisite sconces in the library to arrive at the dining room with its Grinling Gibbons-inspired ornamental wood carvings and stately paneling made of Circassian walnut. A phalanx of Queen Anne-styled chairs with Mrs. Montgomery's artistry as seat covers and a detail of the backsplat. And as we see it today, with everything glowing under what was fondly referred to as a nicotine-colored ceiling, you'll notice there's no chandelier in this room as Mrs. Montgomery found light overhead unflattering and preferred instead to add eight two-arm sconces around the perimeter and copious candles in the center. Moving through the classical limestone breakfast room with chairs discovered in a broken pile in the corner of the basement, now resurrected. Here we have an introduction to the completed butler's pantry, one of the most charming rooms in the house, with all its original china still displayed in the same way and even the original enunciator. And on to the kitchen itself, a clear expression of how much kitchens and all service areas in this era were very much back of the house, but with charming appointments for the staff. Enormous walk-in refrigerators, as they say, for furs, flowers, and food, with a reminder of a truly important message. Let's take a breath here for a moment to talk about logistics. As this became a bigger, more complicated project, Bob realized it couldn't be managed from afar and he knew he had to live on site to be part of every decision. He found the perfect perch from which to watch the goings-on in the third floor, which was originally the servants' quarters and the nursery. Of course, he had to quip that he had moved back to his original room. Going up the main staircase, we arrive on the third floor, which became a glamorous entrance to the private apartment's dining room. The anchor of the private apartments was the living room, in vibrant lemon yellow, capturing every ounce of sunlight to become this marvelous assemblage of family heirlooms. And an asymmetrical corner room became the perfect library. On to the private dining room, host to so many splendid evenings, which opens onto an arched bedroom hall with pastoral landscape walls inspired by the grounds, to the handsome master bedroom and guest bedrooms and the quintessential early 20th century bathroom. Thank you for joining us and please come back for our final video when we put everything into context and reflect on the future.